Well, hello, y'all. I believe we are live. Welcome to Bible study. I have gone um, live a couple of minutes early to give people a chance to find us, and y'all are already hopping on. I love that so much about y'all. So as you hop on, man, y'all are fast. I love your enthusiasm for Bible study. Welcome, welcome. I see y'all are jumping dozens, dozens already. You are fantastic. Uh, I am going to, if you want to, hop over to your Facebook page and share it. It's been so cool to see. I see Christine, Pucky, um, Anne. Hey, Anne. Woo, woo. Um, I'm going to hop over. I see this live, so I'm going to share it onto my Facebook page. So take a minute to do that. There's already over 100 of y'all online. I just love that. So it's gone live on the LWML page. So I am going to share it, pop over here and share it. And take a second to say hi again. Hi, Karen. I want to hear for where you're from. Valerie, Gina, Glenn. I love it. I love y'all. You're so amazing. Uh, I'm popping over here to my Facebook page to share this really quickly. So um, share to, um, I guess, share now and that would go on mine <laughs> you'd think i don't know social media but let's see if it went up there and we'll focus on this and there it is okay we are live all right so now i can put away this mouse Woo! i'm so glad y'all are here let me make sure i've got volume up enough for y'all because i was born with volume but you know betty thank you for loving this study for loving the word hi mary from washington whoop whoop Kansas in the house. Uh, you guys, once again, we are being joined from uh, ladies and a few brave gentlemen from all over the world. I already had comments earlier today. People in Mexico are joining us and um, Nigeria are joining us. And there was some place. Oh, Canada. Our Canada sisters are joining us. So I see Illinois, Iowa. I love it. Say hi to each other and tell us where you're from. Say hi because live in the comments, we have our Vice President of Christian Life, Susan Brunkow, and our two pastoral counselors, Pastor Mitch Schuschler and Pastor Brian Nowak. And uh, President Debbie Larson will probably watch this tomorrow. She had a conflict tonight, but look for her comments tomorrow as she interacts with y'all once she has a chance to watch it because I know a lot of y'all do that too. I want to just give a special shout out whoop, 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 to Kristen O'Shea. She's probably going to die when she sees this, but she is the daughter of our Vice President Christian Live, Susan Brunkow, and she was just elected. She is Senator-elect for the state of Kansas, and she is one of our LWML Young Women Committee members, and I am so, so proud of her for being brave enough to face political waters and for God allowing her to be elected so that we have a Christian voice in government. And so I please keep Kristen and her family in your prayers as you think about all the stuff that's coming up politically. Um, you know, God has prepared her for such a time as this. And I just, LWML lady in senator-elect position. Woo, woo, woo. I'm just, I just, she's going to die when she sees this, but I just had to tell y'all that. We are in, I see it's eight o'clock, so we'll start any second now. We are on, if you have your study guide, we are on page 54 of your study guide. We are on lesson six, lesson six. So if you went online and downloaded the, uh, the one page downloadable, it's lesson six, lesson six. So tonight, you know, last week we talked about the shoes of peace and that was I mean, literally God's perfect timing. And this week, we're talking about the shield of faith God provides. Now we see all that's happened in our country uh, since last Tuesday evening and the shield of faith. God orchestrated it for such a time as this um, to talk about this because, you know, we need this every single day and especially in the days ahead. So I love that. Jackie, hi. Betty, nap. Woo, woo, woo. I love y'all congratulating Kristen just call her Madam Senator-elect and she'll just die because she's so humble, y'all. And Susan, you must just be a proud mama. I just can't even imagine. Okay, so if we are ready, it is 8.01 Central Time. So we are going to get uh, started. So if you would join me in prayer, let's dig into God's Word together. 
Father God, thank you so much for another day of your grace and your love and your glory. Father, I just pray tonight as we dig into your word, it may have been a long day for some of us, and it may have been um, a joyful day for some of us. But Father, whatever circumstance led us here tonight, you have brought us here together into your word. And so, Father, as we dig into your word, that word of life, I pray that you bless us, that you teach us, that you instruct us, and that you encourage us because um, we are yours and we are your soldiers. And so, Father, teach us as your children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when I was growing up, uh, I live in South Texas, just north of Houston. But when I was growing up, both sets of my grandparents lived in Arkansas. And every single year, we would make the pilgrimage from kind of brown South Texas winter to the beautiful winter wonderland that was the Ozarks. And I loved the Ozarks. We would spend a week with my dad's mom in Harrison, Arkansas, and we'd spend a week with my mom's parents in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, all surrounded by the Ozarks and a winter white. And so my sisters and I, the first thing we would do, of course, is plan the whole trip on what we would do the moment we got there. And that literally was our first snowball fight because it may be rote to those of you who live in snow, but when you don't get snow all the time, the first thing you wanna do is nail your sibling with a snowball, <laughs> just saying. And so we, you know, get out of the Jeep, we'd, uh, you know, get our mittens on and get our gear on, our cold gear on, and we'd head outside for our first snowball fight. And we'd make forts and we would exhaust ourselves lobbing these fluffy white grenades at each other. And it was just so much fun. And after hours of that, we would come back inside and grandmother would have um, hot cocoa waiting for us that she had made. And we would all sit around in her bay window that overlooked her front yard that would just look like a, a Norman Rockwell postcard. It had bird feeders where the sparrows and the chickadees and the red cardinals would come. And we would look at the snowman we built, all the snowball paraphernalia on the ground and sipping hot cocoa and watching those red cardinals and life could not have gotten any better. But what I thought about this when I was writing this study is that um, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, we're not talking about fluffy white snowballs being lobbed around. We're talking about fiery darts. We're talking about active warfare. And so tonight, when we're talking about the shield of faith as basically our first line of defense, we have to remember that we are on a spiritual battlefield every single day. And so if you would open your Bible with me and turn to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Can I not even put that on my outline? Ephesians 6. We're going to look at verse 16 tonight. Verse 16. I, I don't know about y'all, but my Bible is like all highlighted and ugly and tabbed because this set of passages is, it's really just a lifeline when the enemy is lobbing darts at you and you need to know that you're not alone. These passages that tell us about his armor are just huge, just huge. And so Ephesians 6 verse 16, it says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take up the shield of faith. Now, picture this. Um, Paul uh, we already talked about he was uh, under arrest, uh, house arrest in, in Rome as he wrote this letter to the Ephesians. And he was looking at the, you know, the paraphernalia of the soldiers and the legionnaires around him. But what this shield is that we're talking about, I want you to picture this. Uh, when I was doing the research, this particular word that Paul uses here for shield is basically it is a ginormous door-sized shield. It's four foot tall by two feet wide. And it is just huge. Now think of that scale to you. Like however tall you are, where does four foot come on you? I, I don't know. I'm five nine, so maybe four foot is, is, I don't know, maybe here. But what this shield that Paul was talking about, you could literally fit your whole self behind it to where there was nothing exposed to the enemy. And so that's the word here that Paul uses for uh, the shield. 
Now, I'm kind of a visual person. I'm picturing this ginormous, probably pretty heavy door-sized shield. And I'm thinking of the guys who had to carry that. You know, I, I, for some reason, I pictured Popeye, the sailor man, who, you know, he's all limpy with the noodle arms until he eats spinach. And then he's like, dun, 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 dun. I pictured the guys having like a Popeye spinach arm because of the weight of the shield and like a noodle arm on this side because it's not getting as much of a workout. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's neither here nor there. That's just my visual. But this this shield was huge. And the first fill-in in the, in the book is, is this. The shield comes from a Greek word meaning door. It's our first line of defense. Shield comes from a Greek word meaning door and it's our first line of defense. Now, why is that significant? Because the faith given by God is our first line of defense. And that is huge. Think of your, think of your home, not your property, like if you have access gates and stuff, but just think of your home. What is the first line of defense for your home? It's the door. It's the, we have a, a ringer doorbell or we have deadbolts or we have all these things, but the door is the first line of defense into a house. The door is the first line of defense, so it's faith. It's the faith that God gives us first because when God gives us that gift of faith, everything else comes after that. You know, the, the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the spiritual gifts all come after God gives us that gift of faith. And so it has to be first. So it's significant that it's first. And I love the fact that the shield covers the rest of it. You know, we've talked about the breastplate and the belt of truth. Well, you put all that stuff on and then you hold up the shield of faith and it is an additional layer of defense. And it's the first place where the darts hit from the enemy. And so we're talking about layers and layers of protection and provision you know, that God gives to us. And I want you to, to realize something important about this particular piece in the armor of God. It's the only piece where the unambiguous purpose is given. Every other thing, you know, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, those could be interpreted many ways. But for the shield of faith, it's specifically told to to, to stop the fiery darts of the enemy. So it's the only piece of armor where the exact purpose is actually given to us. And isn't that wonderful that we don't have to question faith? We don't have to question the protection that God has given us. It's, it's just incredible. So the purpose that we're talking about here that Paul wanted us to understand is your next fill in in the book. It's the shield's purpose is to extinguish the fiery darts. The shield's purpose is to extinguish the fiery darts. Cheers. Tonight, I have Coke Zero in my sing mug. It says sing here with the little birdie because, you know, little birdies sing. And it says two birds never sing the same song. I know y'all love mugs and what I'm drinking. So Coke Zero in the sing mug. So when we're talking about this shield, what was the composition? Well, in researching what the composition was of these door size shields, here's what we're talking about. So, so picture this with me. Usually these door size shields were two pieces of wood that had been glued together. And then a piece of linen was covering the whole um, pieces of those two woods. And on top of the linen was a layer of leather, tough leather, over the top of that, and then around the edges were bronze or iron uh, rings that would keep that shield in place. So you're talking about the shield that is basically a leather front with the bronze and iron sides uh, holding it together around the circumference. Now, the interesting and the most interesting thing about that shield is you can soak leather in water. And so when you're talking about extinguishing fiery darts, you can actually soak the shield in water and there's nothing, if the shield was wooden, it would catch on fire and that would be it. But the shield that Paul is talking about is designed in such a way that it never catches flame, that it extinguishes any fiery dart that ever hits it. 
And isn't that a beautiful picture of the shield of faith that God has given us? It's, it's just incredible. So as Paul is describing the purpose of this shield, the people of his day, they had seen them all around. They are clearly picturing what this shield looks like. And so the words and the meaning was not lost on the audience Paul was writing to. And so let's talk about a couple of characteristics of the shield. When you're talking about a, a shield in battlefield, when you're talking about a shield on the spiritual battlefield, um, the first thing is we've already talked about it. It's the first line of defense. It's the first line of defense. It's the first thing the darts hit. Okay, so what happens if we don't pick up or take up, as it says, the shield of faith? Then what happens? You know, that's the thing that's going to extinguish the dart. So it's the first line of defense. But another thing a shield does is it guards. It guards. Okay, so what does it guard? Everything behind it. Everything behind it. All of us. It guards, uh, it guards our heart, it guards our mind, it guards our um, resist to temptation, it guards the shield of faith, guards us from the enemy's arrows that can set those things aflame with doubt and things like that. And so um, it guards us, it guards our heart, it guards our mind, it guards our trust in the truth of the Lord's word, it guards our belief. And I just love that the faith uh, the shield of faith is also a guard for us. Isn't that beautiful? But the shield also deflects. It deflects. When we have faith as a shield in front of us, just put that in context with a spiritual warfare. Put that in context with a mean girl coworker who likes to lob verbal darts at you. You know, that shield of faith, when you know you're secure in Christ, there's nothing that person can say or do that's going to make a difference. It's a shield of defense, again, to guard our hearts and to guard our minds and to know that no matter what happens on this earth, we are secure in Christ. We are secure in Christ. So the shield is our first line of defense and it guards us and it deflects the fiery darts of the enemy. Now, When I'm talking about the fiery darts um, that the enemy throws, um, we're talking about uh, temptation. We're talking about any, any dart that is thrown that's going to pull you away from God and the things of God and the mission of God. Those are the fiery darts that we are talking about. Anything to distract us, anything to dissuade us from the path that God has called us to. So... Um, I love, I see prayers going in the comments. I love um, y'all are praying for each other. That's absolutely beautiful. But what was interesting, I thought, okay, that's the big shield. But there were all kinds of shields, just like there were all kinds of weapons. But what was interesting is some of the different smaller shields, they were round shields, and they were called bucklers. But another word for those um, smaller shields was a target. And I found that very compelling to know that once we take up that shield of faith, that we actually become the target that it is. Because when we are secure in Christ, you know, we've talked about this, that target goes on your back and that is what the enemy is lobbing his darts at, straight at you, straight at you. So when we're given the gift of faith, we become that target. And I found it interesting that the smaller shields are called bucklers or targets, even though that's not what's used here. So basically what God has given us is door-sized protection. Now, how many of y'all have seen the movie Gladiator with, um, oh, what is his name? Russell Crowe. There's a couple of scenes when they are in the rink fighting, in the arena fighting. And there's one scene in particular where um, Russell Crowe calls all the guys into the center and they put all their shields up around him to where literally it creates this impenetrable dome of shields. That's exactly the shield that Paul is talking about right here. That's exactly the shield. So if you've seen the movie Gladiator and you've seen that scene, picture that. Those shields were nothing to be messed with. You could hide a whole people behind them. And so I love that God gives us that gift of faith to protect us from anything and everything that the enemy is ever going to lob at us. So I want us to look at a place in scripture um, 
that talks about God being our shield. Turn with me, if you would please, all the way back to the first book in the Bible. Turn with me to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, and we're going to look at verse 1. Genesis 15, verse 1. Genesis 15, verse 1. The context of the passages that we're looking at is God's covenant with Abraham. The time when he, when he calls Abraham and he is about to give Abraham his calling and make that covenant with Abraham. And so that's the context. So Genesis 15, 1 says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, who we know later is Abraham, the Lord came to Abram in a vision, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. What I love about, what is poignant about that passage is that God gave Abraham, told Abraham that he was his shield before he gave Abraham his calling. In other words, later on in those passages, when God gives Abraham his calling, gives Abram the, the, what he's to do with his life, Abram already knows that he has God as his shield. And so what that translates to us as God, he gives us the shield first and then he gives us the calling. Because when we have that gift of faith, the Holy Spirit enters us and we are able to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, do what God has called us to do. But the shield comes first. The faith comes first. And so no matter what you've been called to, God is your shield before he was anything else. You know, and so that is really, really cool. You have this picture of Abram actually being protected already. There's Dorito. Before he even steps on the battlefield, he's already got the God as his shield. And that is just huge. But another thing in that passage, it says that the shield is a very great reward. That it's a very great reward. Now, when you and I think of reward, we think of earthly, tangible things, uh, monetary things, bling, you know, whatever those things are. But what God is talking about here, it's the heavenly intangible gift of faith. And what that is, is the keys to heaven. And there is no greater reward. When we are saved from this life, preserved for the next, that is the most priceless gift God has ever, ever given to mankind. And so that reward even though we may think it's bling, it's not. It's a spiritual reward of the keys of heaven when we follow Jesus by faith. Because, you know, what does it tell us in Scripture? He is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so that faith, that faith is given first. That shield is given first. And we want heaven. We want heaven. Because hell is a scary place. I don't know if y'all have ever done research on hell and a lot of people wonder, you know, what exactly is hell? I'm curious, what, um, in the comments, how would y'all describe hell? I'm curious uh, what y'all would say. But what it is, it's a very scary place. Because it's basically the absence of all the good things of God. It's the absence of His presence. It's the absence of light. It's the absence of joy no love, nothing like that. It's the absence of everything that a lot of times here on earth, we take for granted. You know, the sun rose, the moon rose, the stars are there. Okay, none of that is true for hell. Hell is a dark, scary, watery place. So heaven is what we want. So when God gives us that gift of faith and gives us the keys to heaven, it is a very great reward. It is the greatest reward that we will ever have. And, you know, my heart hurts for those who don't know that reward yet or haven't received that reward yet. You know, for going on 25 years now, uh, my friend Susan, you've probably heard me mention her in other studies. Um, we've been friends for 25 years, but she's an atheist. And God has me in her life for a reason because what Susan believes, basically, is that when this life is over, she, it's dust. She's going to dust. She doesn't believe that her soul is an eternal being. And so when she thinks that this life is over and I'm just dust, what she doesn't realize is there the most important part of her is going one place or the other. And it hurts my heart when I think about that for her because 
anyone who doesn't know Christ, that is exactly that is exactly their destination. And the lake of fire and all those things that we hear about. And but I'm not giving up on her. You know, it's been 25 years. <laughs> I struggle with patience sometimes. This has been the biggest test of patience because I struggle with, okay, maybe I didn't say it well enough. You know, maybe I didn't um, explain it good. Maybe I didn't, I didn't love her enough. Well, the problem with all those statements is it's focused on me. This is, this is between her and God. God is the one that's going to move in her life. So as he moves in her life, he's positioned me in her life in such a way as to make a difference. And what is so cool, because she's incredibly smart. I don't know how many book clubs she belongs to, but she's just incredibly smart. And she loves books. <laughs> I just love that God paired her with an author, you know, because she's very excited to hear about the publishing process and, you know, the Esther study that's coming out in, in March. She wants to hear about all the behind the scenes of, of what's going on with the cover art and all that stuff. But in those conversations, yeah, it's neat to share that with her. But guess what the book is about? It's about Jesus. It's about God. It's about things of faith. And so God orchestrated it such a way to where when I first met Susan, I wasn't an author, but I am now. And when Susan, who loves books, wants to know what the next book is, it's a wide open door that God has given me to carefully and lovingly tell her what the book is about you know, and kind of what I believe in those things and the, the security and the strength that that gives me. So what in has God given you in someone's life? Because there's a match somehow in some way. There's a reason if you have people in your life or people around you who are not believers, and I hope that you do because they keep you sharp. They keep you sharp because my friend can smell Christianese at 50 paces. She can smell something phony, and so when she asks questions, she doesn't want the proper answer. When someone's hurting, they don't need proper. They need real. And the real truth is, Jesus Christ died to save her. And one of these days, I am praying, 25 years now into it, I'm praying that one day that will be true in her life as well. But God put me in her life for a reason. And so whose life has he put you in for a reason? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about uh, leading in that relationship with the shield of faith? Because given as a first line of defense, you know, that leads. And so I, I would just encourage you to think about um, who God has put in your life that can be led, um, that you can lead with the shield of faith in love, you know, in timing. Because I can always sense when Susan has heard enough of the Christian stuff, as she says it. It's enough of the Christian stuff. Okay, okay, I'll get it. And she's told me a couple of times, okay, yeah, you know I don't believe what you believe, so let's just move on. And I have to be able to take that in love and still remain engaged with her. Don't give up. Eternity is at stake. And God has given us the armor, leading with the shield of faith as a first line of defense to protect us from the fiery darts and to give us an end into people's lives because God is love. And when we follow him and we love him, that exudes from our life. And that is something that people are hungry for, hungry for. So lead with love, holding that shield of faith tight. Now, I want to debunk a myth. <laughs> Cheers. I want to debunk a myth that um, I was actually surprised to hear um, a friend say years ago. She said, oh, I love the, the shield of faith because, you know, you can hide behind it. Well, you can, but that's not the purpose of the shield of faith. The shield of faith, it says in the passage to take up the shield of faith. We're not supposed to ground it and hide behind it and just stay there away from the world and afraid. We are called to take it up and engage. And so the myth that we're debunking is we're not given the shield of faith to hide behind it. We're given the shield of faith as a first line of defense so that when God calls us onto our place in the battlefield, we're not going down, that we're holding that shield of faith. And so if you think it's just a hide behind, it's not. It says take up, take up the shield of faith. It means hold up, get engaged, knowing you're protected. And that's a, that's a huge difference. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get hurt. That, you know, God never promised that. 
we're going to get hurt on the battlefield. That's just part of warfare, especially spiritual warfare. But that taking up is a personal calling of faith to God for each and every one of us because it's a faith that's ours. It's a personal calling for each one of us individually. I cannot take up my parents' shield of faith or my sibling's shield of faith or my spouse's shield of faith or the children, whoever it is. God issues armor to each soldier. We take up the shield of our shield of faith. And so one thing that's interesting to watch with confirmation kids is, is when they you know finish their two-year confirmation process and they're in eighth grade, it's like their faith is now been instructed and learned and now it's their time to take up that shield of faith. It's no longer their parents' faith. It is the faith that God has given them and they pick up that shield and head into ninth grade, which <laughs> has its own battle. <laughs> it just has its own battle. But um, I put on your outline the Greek word there for um, thyreos. It's thyreos and it's the Greek word for the shield. Thyreos, it's a door size protection door size protection. I know we've talked about that, but basically it means that we are indestructible on the battlefield when we're holding that shield of faith by faith. Now, what I love about the Psalms, absolutely love about the Psalms, is it mentions many times God being our shield and our reward. And I want us to look at one of those places together. And so flip forward to Psalm 144. Psalm 144. I have to get past it. I've got one of those clippy, it's kind of heavy. It's like a clippy uh, magnet page holder and it just crumples my Bible pages, but I have to keep it because it's a cup of coffee. <laughs> just saying. So Psalm 144.2. Psalm 144.2. <laughs> as you're getting there, I want to share something with you. You know, many of you know that I always talk about life as being unicorns. You know, life is, you know, everything is unicorns and magical and fantastic. And so when my sisters and I were on our sister trip a couple of weeks ago, I was in Fredericksburg, Texas, went into this little wine shop with my sisters, and they had all kind of tea towels and stuff. And I had to bring this tea towel home because it says, someone told me I was delusional. I almost fell off my unicorn. <laughs> okay, that's a side note. It just happened to be sitting here by my by my Coke Zero uh, mug. Okay, so Psalm 144, uh, verse 2. Psalm 144, verse 2. It says, He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. What that says my shield in he in whom I take refuge. What that basically means is when we take up the shield, the victory has already been won, not by anything we did, but by everything God did. Our job, take up the shield and let him do the work. That's what he does. And so that faith, that shield of faith, is the complete reliance on God to get us through every situation, every day, every hurt, every joy, every challenge, every dart. We take up that shield of faith, we step on the battlefield, and let God bring the victory, because that's what he does. Now, I think if we could see the enemy, you know, it talks about the, the enemy in the heavenly places. You know, I think if we could see the enemy, it would scare our freckles right off because that is just a scary, scary thing. You know, people have this picture of, you know, he's the little red guy with the horns and the pitchfork. I think he blends into the crowds. I think we don't see him sometimes when he's right in front of us. And that is a scary, scary thing. And so when we take up that shield of faith, it protects us in those moments. So the next fill-in, the next fill-in on this, on your thing, the Greek word for faith, since we're talking about faith, the Greek word for faith there, just fix this here. The Greek word for faith is pistis, pistis, and it refers to a belief and trust with implications that actions based on that trust will follow. It refers to a belief and trust with implications that actions 
based on that trust will follow. In other words, faith moves. Faith moves. It's not something that's sedentary or passive. Faith moves. Because honestly, when when we trust, uh, think about just an everyday uh, situation. When we're confident and we're trusting, we are moving. We are stepping out without fear. But when we're scared, we ball up. We hold back. We hunker down. We slow down. Faith moves. Faith moves. So it's the belief and trust that implications, that actions based on that trust, the trust that God is going to get us through any circumstance, when we believe that by faith, we're going to step out because faith moves. That faith given to us, that what the shield embodies. Now, another myth that maybe some of, some of us hold is that it's not faith in faith. Um, we don't have faith in faith. We have faith in God who gives us faith. That's a huge difference. It's not faith that faith is going to protect us. It's faith that God Almighty will never leave us or forsake us and that he's there. So it's faith in him. It's the faith that says, I believe you, God, when you say you're going to do what you say you're going to do. I trust that you will get me through this. I trust, I mean, fill in the blank with whatever's going on in your life. I trust you, God. I believe you, God. I believe you, God. Faith in God. We trust that the shield that he's given us protects us when our faith moves us onto the battlefield because faith moves. What does it say? Faith without works is dead. Faith moves. Faith uh, moves towards people, accomplishes things, reaches people for the kingdom, gets involved in mission. LWML, hello, that's all of us. Faith moves. And I love that about LWML. We're not concerned about a whole lot other than mission and women and the word and glorifying God. We're all about moving people toward God to love God and to serve God. I love, love, love LWML about that. So when we're talking about the shield of faith and we're talking about the trust and that faith moves, what is that what does that ring true for us in scripture? In Mark 9, 23, it says, everything is possible with God. Everything is possible for him or her who believes. Everything is possible. Everything, yes. Forgiveness when you feel like you can't. Loving instead of hating. Trusting when you want to doubt. Everything is possible. Being courageous instead of fearful, everything is possible with God. Especially wearing his armor and brandishing that shield of faith. Everything is possible with God. Now, in Ephesians 6, if you, if you read through the, the verses of the armor of God, the verses 10 through 20 or 10, 10 through 18, you see a, a vision of open warfare. Uh, Paul is describing open warfare, active, ongoing, open warfare. The, heaven, the dark forces in the heavenly places, the lobbing of the darts, the soldiers in armor. He's talking about open warfare. Soldiers suited up, darts flying, <laughs> swords brandishing. It's an active place. And Paul is inviting us to see the scene so that we can more appreciate by faith the armor that God has given us to withstand it, stand firm through it and despite of it, and move where God tells us to go. It, it's just huge. So what were fiery darts? You know, we keep talking about fiery darts. So what were they? Well, in Paul's day, fiery darts were made with, with cane, like uh, small cane poles or cane sticks that had flammable ends on them. A lot, a lot of times it was sheep hair covered in linen and soaked in a flammable uh, substance and put on a bow and arrow and lobbed into enemy camps. So that's kind of what you're looking at. Think of a, a, a small cane pole with a flammable end that someone lights and that lit dart heads into enemy territory, heads in when we're talking about spiritual warfare, heads into our life. So 
fiery darts coming at us. What does that look like in your life right now? What do those fiery darts look like? What did they look like even today? You know, what what did you feel the enemy, enemy lobbing at you where you were holding that shield of faith, thankful for that shield of faith? I mean, because that those those flaming darts can sneak up on you. And I want you to realize that the flaming dart was the most advanced uh, warfare tactic of its day. It was like Satan was using the most advanced technology for the day. He still does that today. Think of what our most... Um, what our most powerful weapon is today when it comes to our most advanced uh, weapon of today. It's technology. It's technology. And when, when you see some of the stuff happening on the internet, it's not a far stretch to know that that is the modern technology that Satan sometimes uses. But by faith, by faith, we can reclaim that territory for God. We can. And he will give us the power to do that. You know, I've said before, during this pandemic, I just saw God blow up on the internet because everyone was forced to go um, virtual. So all of a sudden, here's all these websites of Bible studies and sermons and God reclaiming some ground in the most advanced weapon of the day, in the most advanced technological field of the day. And I just, I loved seeing that. But it was... The arrow that the enemy lobs, when Paul's talking about fiery darts, it wasn't just an arrow, it was a fiery dart. Okay, why fire? Why fire? Why not something else? Why, I don't know, fill in the blank. Why fire? Because when you use fire, it destroys something to the point of being unrecognizable. If you've ever had something catch on fire, I remember years ago, um, my sister uh, my older sister, her study caught on fire where she was working on her computer. Uh, she had a couple of candles burning and went outside to grab the mail and looked back and one of the curtains in the open window had fluttered over the candle and all of a sudden her study was on fire. And it was, I mean, thankfully, um, her and her husband were able to jump in with a hose and kind of douse some things before the fire department got there. But I remember going over there the next morning to take them coffee and donuts because basically it... Even though it was just the study, it, it affected the whole house. There was smoke in every nook and cranny. There was black everywhere. I mean, it was just a gross mess. But in the study itself, where the flame was, it was unrecognizable. The memorabilia that she had in there was melted beyond recognition. It was charred. It was, you couldn't tell what some of the things were. Now think of that fiery dart in a loved one or in you. Or in a friend. The fiery dart of temptation. The fiery dart of addiction. You know, when meth first hit the, um, hit the streets, I remember um, trying to figure out what meth was. How was it made? How, how did people, what is meth? And then I saw pictures of people who had become addicted to meth because meth is highly, highly addictive. And they had this whole page on this website about the, the effects of meth. And it had before and after pictures of like soccer moms. The soccer mom before and four months later after she'd been on meth. And she was literally unrecognizable. The dart of temptation, when, when, that dart of, when we relax that shield of faith and we allow those darts of temptation, those darts to get into us, it can cause us to go into a burn, a slow flame that sometimes maybe we don't recognize. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Sometimes it's a slow burn like a meth. I'll never forget when I had one of those slow burn incidents in my life. For me, it was anger. It was anger. I had gone through a season in life that I was really just angry about how life was going, the things that were happening in my life, and I was just angry. And I didn't intend to be angry it was that I had relaxed my faith and listened to the naysayers and stayed in the pity party of woe was me a little too long. And before I knew it, that slow burn of anger. And then one day a friend was brave enough to say to me, you just seem really mad all the time. What is going on? And I remember being shocked. I was like, mad? I'm not mad. What do you mean I'm not mad? <laughs> you get it. I was just 
angry and I didn't realize that I had let that anger take root over what was happening, over living in the poor as me state or whatever. And so that trusted friend who was brave enough to be honest didn't abandon me. She walked me through it. She, um, she said, now see what you just said? That's angry. And I was like, what do you mean it's angry? <laughs> Don't you love friends who stick with you no matter how you are? If you've turned into a mean girl because something got in and there's a slow burn going. But I had allowed a flaming dart of bitterness to get in. A flaming dart of woe is me to get in. And it was slowly burning and affecting everything. And it was starting to affect people around me. You know, like, like here she comes. Oh, we have to be somewhere else fast, you know. But I was so thankful to that friend who pointed out... I'm smelling some smoke, you know, in your life. I hope that you have some women, brave Christian women in your life who will tell you when they're smelling some smoke, who they'll let you know that there's a fiery dart that's, that's, that's gotten past the shield somehow. So let's pray through this. Let's figure this out. Those women, they are priceless. They are priceless. For that season for me, it took just months of prayer and professional counseling. It was along with a lot of other stuff, but it, it, it was a slow flame that would have disintegrated me, my faith, my life, everything else, because I'd allowed it in. And so when you realize you're in a slow burn, <laughs> on your knees before God, okay, okay, this is what's going on. Please show me a way. Show me what am I doing? What do I need? To and he will show you. He will show you prayer, counseling, and friends who endured snarkiness for months and still walked with me. Some of the snarkiness still comes out, but that's just because I'm a smart aleck. So what about verbal darts? Can we, can we talk about those for a minute? You know, we've talked about mean girls. You know, those childhood, those childhood um, bullies who turn into adult mean girls who just, for the sake of being mean, just are not nice. You know, what about mean girls? Yeah, I see the frowny face. Yeah, mean girls. What about verbal darts that we lob at one another? Not cool. Not cool. When we lob fiery darts at one another of, uh, well, fill in the blank. I'm not going to fill in the scenario. But when we lob darts at each other, that was never, when I see Christians lobbing darts at other Christians, that is not okay. That is never okay. The enemy fires darts on us. We stand shoulder to shoulder against that. We're not supposed to lob darts at each other behind the shield. You know, that's just not how it goes. Because when we lob darts at one another, it doesn't build up. It tears down and it causes destruction. It hurts us. It hurts the mission. And so when it happens, if you're the one lobbing the darts or if you're the one um, being shot upon, just surrender those to Jesus. Surrender the, say, okay, see this one in the shield, Jesus? Okay, that one hurt. Heal my heart. You know what? He will. He will. Every single time, he will. One of the things that I just, when we're talking about lobbing darts at one another, one of the things that I, that absolutely will get me mad is when I see sheep lobbing darts at loving, servant-hearted pastors. When I see that, I come unglued because that is not okay. That is not okay. Um, our pastors are given to us as shepherds. And yes, they make mistakes too, but we're not supposed to lob darts at them. We walk with them. We walk through things with them. We support them. You know, that's what we do. Um, we don't lob darts at our pastors. We're never supposed to lob darts at one another. That's not okay. So what are some of the verbal darts that the enemy can, can launch? Uh, and maybe it's in the quiet of the night when doubt has slipped in. And the verbal dart may sound something like, you're just a housewife. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. Fill in the blank. You're not blank. You're not blank. Those verbal darts plant that slow burn of doubt. Okay, well, maybe I'm not all this. Maybe I'm not this. And it's a slow burn, an erosion of, of confidence and trusting God that he's put you in the place you are, given you the skills and gifts he's given you to do what he's called you to do. So when those verbal darts 
come from the enemy of doubt, take up that shield of faith. Take up that shield of faith. Getting that shield of faith um, before us gives us the strength. And he gives us the strength to pull that shield up when we can't. Gives us the strength to withstand. And what does it say in Ephesians 6? Stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm. Because if we don't surrender, if we don't surrender those fiery darts to God, to Jesus for healing, we're going to slow burn into cinders and be ineffective. And, and it, it'll take us out of the thing. But God, but God promises. He promises that no weapon, no weapon forged against us will prosper. Lady, say hi to lady. She feels needy. But God gives us the strength to take up the shield of faith. No weapon formed against us shall proper, prosper. No weapon. Fill in the blank again. No weapon. So we're talking about a shield of faith, and that's the first line of defense. Why is faith so important? Why is, have you ever asked that? Why is faith so important? Because that is what the enemy is after to steal and to kill and to destroy. Because without faith, we don't have hope. We don't have salvation. We don't have all these lists of things. The enemy is after your faith. That's what he's after, to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what I love about the Apostle Paul. When he was writing to Timothy at the end of, his, at the end of Paul's life, the, the last book he wrote was 2 Timothy. And it was a letter to Timothy. And he said this in 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Paul knew that the faith was so important that he was clutching to it with all his strength so that when he skidded sideways into heaven, he was clutching that shield of faith with every bit of strength that God had given him. I have kept the faith. That's us on the spiritual battlefield. I have kept the faith. No matter what happens running the race, I have kept the faith. Oh, sister, I pray that that's you. I pray that that's you. No matter what happens, we are clutching with all of our strength, all the strength God gives us to clutch that shield of faith to where nothing gets past it. And we are useful for him in service to him on the battlefield and in missions. So I want to ask you a question. You're not going to like this one. Are you a warrior or a whiner? Are you a warrior or a whiner? I've heard both. I've been both. And I bet you have too. Because women, we tend to be good whiners. Don't we? We're good whiners. One of the things that I had trouble with when I first became a Christian were Christians who weren't excited about what they were doing for God. I didn't get that because it didn't match. And, you know, when I'd say, when I first got involved in LWML, I'd be like, wow, you made that many quilts. That's incredible. And they're like, yeah, yeah, they're just quilts. What? Or, wow, look at all these mite boxes that are filled with change. There were some over here that were excited and some over here that were like, uh, it's just change. Is this your whiner season? Is this where you're not excited about serving God? Are you exhausted? May I please, for the sake of the rest of us, please take a Sabbath break. Please take a rest. It's okay to say no. The rest of us will appreciate it. Please say no. Take a break. Let your yes be yes and be excited about it. It's not just quilts. It's not just change. Those just things are changing the world for the kingdom of God. It's quilts through Luther Moore Relief, through LWML, that, that people across the world use as, as beds, as curtains, as wraps, as whatever it is. And that change, the change that goes in the mite box that we don't think maybe is a lot, is changing lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not just change. So get excited. And if you feel excited, but it's not really showing, could you notify your face? I'm saying that out of love. Get excited. God is doing some amazing things. He's given us his armor. He's given us the shield of faith. And we are excited to be there for him because of him. And we've been given the calling because he gave it. So get excited about it. 
And if you're in a season where you're exhausted or you tend to be a little whiny, take a break. Take a Sabbath break because chances are that's what you need. And I say that out of love. If you needed permission, there it is. Take a break. Take some water, sit on the bench for a little bit. Let God refuel you, heal you, work with you. Step back on the battlefield. Wonderful. <clears throat> so warrior women, that's what I want to close with. It's 8.52. Warrior women, you're standing firm with those shields on the battlefield. And you're being lobbed on with the fiery darts. The enemy is lobbing things on you. And you're not whiners, you're warriors. And you're standing firm on the ground Christ won at the cross. And so let me ask you, are you being fired upon? Are you being fired upon? Are you a frontline soldier that the enemy is firing upon? Or are you one of the permanent hide behind the shield kind of women? And I ask that because I've been that. You know, the seasons where, you know, let them do it for a change. I do it all. We've talked about that in our earlier study. What does that look like? But as we close, I, I just want to say this. The shield of faith is designed to protect us. The shield of faith is designed to, to be our first line of defense, to guard us, to deflect those those flaming arrows, and so we hold it up. And what I pray for us, what I pray for us is that we are so engaged in the battle that God has called us to, is that when we hold up that shield of faith, that it is not, we, you know, when we give accountability to God, it's not how many arrows we avoided, it's how many arrows are embedded in that shield because you are out there doing the thing, and we offer that shield on our knees on our knees with those fiery darts that he has extinguished in that shield of faith. And we offer that as a praise offering. That didn't get me, God, because of you. That didn't get me because of you. This was lobbed at me because of you, and you took care of it. So what I pray is at the end, when, when we are skidding into heaven sideways, clutching that shield of faith, I pray that it is full of darts that God himself has extinguished because you are in it to win it. You are a warrior princess for God. And I love that about LWML, and I love that about you. So we are called to take up our shield of faith. It is our very great reward, our shield of faith. And so the next time you go through these passages or you see a shield or you think of the word shield, ask yourself, where's mine? Is it propped against the wall or am I holding it up and letting it gather some darts for Jesus? Whew. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the armor that you've given us. Father, thank you so much for the shield of faith, that very great reward, that gift that you have given us that surpasses everything we could possibly ask or imagine. Father, thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for us. Father, I pray as we go into our holiday seasons, Father, as we go into maybe a, a more tumultuous time in our country, as we still struggle with this coronavirus. Father, I just pray that we suit up and we pick up that shield of faith. We take it up and we're on your battlefield for you, proclaiming love, proclaiming that you are the hope that we can trust in without, without a fault. So Father, work that in us as we continue to, to work through our study until we meet next week. Father, I just pray that as we dig into your word, as we do the daily homework, Father, I just pray that you continue to draw us closer to you um, we thank you for grace and love and mercy, and we thank you for the beauty and majesty of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Oh, I made myself choky. I love being a warrior with y'all. Just standing by y'all on the battlefield, I just, it is one of the great privileges in life. So, we have like four minutes do you have any questions? I'm just going to trust God and whatever comes by as it comes by, we're going to talk about. Um, Kay, amen. Thank you. I love you. I love you too, Kay. You're amazing. Um, I've been both a warrior and a whiner. Thank you for that honesty, Corliss. I think we all have. I think we all have. And um, it's a season. 
and it's an ebb and flow, but we trust God to get us back out there instead of being whiners. I see all of y'all. Thank you for the wonderful Bible study. Y'all, God gives us his matchless word. You, you just, when you spend time in there, we come away enriched and encouraged and full of hope and full of, we can actually do the thing because we're not the one doing it. The shield of faith, the shield of faith, warrior. Oh, amen. Thank you. Y'all are amazing. So the shield of faith, that's that. So that's lesson six. Next week, we have lesson seven. And so we are like, what is that? Two thirds away through this study. It's not too late to get the book and to jump in with us at lesson seven and catch up later. Um, I have so much loved being with y'all online. There are hundreds of you online now. And what I love about this is that as you look on Facebook later, there will be thousands and thousands of views as you have shared it. And people are engaged in Bible study literally around the world. So I, I thank God for you and for your love for the word and for tuning in every night or watching when it comes back on. As soon as this goes out, I'll be in the comments for your prayers. Please leave us your prayer request. I see Pastor Nowak has been in there um, answering prayers and Susan Brunkow answering prayers. We love praying for y'all. That is one of our biggest, our biggest privileges. And so leave us your prayer request. I love you guys. Have a wonderful week. God is in control. That's all I'm going to say. I love you guys. And I'll see you next week. Same bat channel, same bat time. I love you, sisters. Bye.